Uh, hello, I don't know if it's John, uh, whoever had logged in from West Windsor. I just want to uh, go on the record. Uh, Lou Milan is both, well, all three of Lou Milan, Crystalia, and Barbara Lazaro from New Jersey Transit. So we're all on, on from Lou. Who's line? That's, just want that's, that's great. So, um, and you were promoted to panelist, right? Yep. And as was Adam Catherine, who is from Stantec, he's the study team. He will be doing um, the presentation. And then we should have uh, two others from our end, Via Katz and Mike Viscardi, who uh, also would need to be made um, as panelists. And then we should be good at that point. Okay. And it's showing. So Lou Milan is a panelist. Adam Catherine's a panelist. Um, there's a uh, there's a login on here. Just Chris, no last name. Is that Chris Delia? That, that, no, that wouldn't be me. I, this is Chris Delia speaking. I'm I'm on Lou's line. That oh. must be somebody else attending the meeting. I'm sorry, I was a little distracted. No, no <laughs> worries. Say that. I heard John. That. John, by the way. Yes, I'm John. Uh, My pleasure. And um, Michael Stevens is here. Councilman Stevens is here with me. Hello. Hey, Councilman. <laughs> so yeah, again, we would just need uh, the Leah Katz and, and Mike Viscardi, and then and then we would be good from our end. Okay. Help if I reposition this so that the camera can see all of us. I'm kind of limited with the cable here, but I could turn the video on. And then we can just turn it yeah. when we need to talk. Yeah. Okay, so for panelists, currently we have uh, the Lou Milan login, we have Adam Catherine, we have Leah Katz, and we have Michael Stevens. Good evening. Hi, Leah. Hi. And hi, Adam. Hello, good evening. And I will caution everyone, I'm sure Chris talked talk to you about it. We're we're currently live. There's not a pre-meeting with this webinar. So uh, this is part of the recording at this point. Thank you. Understood. Yep. Or is Mike in? Mike is far in. Mike, are you with us? He might not be on yet. Uh, he is. I'm promoting him to panelists now. Since we're all in the same room, we're going to take turns. Hi, Ron. We're going to take turns angling, depending on who's speaking. So, <laughs> okay. Just uh, go slow so you don't give anyone motion sickness. Yes. No. Indeed. The realities of the digital world. John, I just heard from the mayor. He should be joining in um, on his way back on, on his route. I'll look for his login and make sure he gets promoted to, pan to a panelist.
a little bit after five, we'll get started. Um, so I'm going to get us started and we can um, get into the presentation. So good evening and welcome to our meeting about the New Jersey Transit, Princeton Transit Way Study along the Dinky Corridor between West Windsor Township and Princeton. I'm John Taylor, Assistant Township Engineer for West Windsor Township, and I will be facilitating the discussion this evening. The residents and business owners of West Windsor Township welcome representatives from New Jersey Transit as well as their consultant Stantec. Our agenda this evening starts with a presentation from New Jersey Transit to describe the planning process and current status of the concept study. After this presentation is complete, there will be an opportunity for residents and the community at large to ask questions which may have not been answered in the presentation about the study. Our meeting tonight is focused primarily on the improvements and changes in the portion of this rail system within West Windsor Township. Everyone's encouraged to ask questions and not make statements. Please type all questions and any statements into the Q&A section so those become part of the meeting record. There will be an opportunity for residents and invited attendees to ask questions verbally. Whether you provide a verbal or only written question, please provide your name, what group you represent, and your address and or location in the community. Written comments will be read aloud and answered as appropriate. For verbal questions, your microphone will be unmuted and you will be able to ask your question. Verbal questions will be limited to three minutes maximum to be respectful of the time of all attendees. Please do not unmute your microphone unless you are speaking and mute it as soon as you are done speaking. Disruptive behavior will result in your microphone being muted for the rest of the meeting and or your connection to the meeting being terminated. So I'd like to turn the meeting at this point over to Chris Delia and uh, Adam Catherine. Just wanted to say thank you again for having New Jersey Transit here and giving us the opportunity to engage in uh, quick dialogue, answer questions regarding the Princeton Transitway study. 
Um, we're very appreciative of all of the community feedback we've received, um, both from our riders as well as those who are you know, key stakeholders, planners in the area. Um, and you know, we're looking forward to fielding some of your questions after this presentation. So with that, I'll turn it over to Adam. Can everybody uh, see my screen? Okay, great. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for uh, tuning in this evening. My name is Adam Catherine. I'm a, the project manager with Stantec and we're the consultant to NJ Transit on the Princeton Transitway study. This evening, I'll be providing a, a presentation that will go over what we've done to date so far in the project. We'll talk about some of the key existing conditions and needs which spurred this project, um, spurred the study, I should say. Then we'll discuss the preliminary alternatives. We'll discuss the preferred alternative, and then we'll open it up to question and answer period. So the Princeton Transitway study is a concept level review uh, of the Princeton branch, really to help ident direct the future of the corridor. And you can see here on the map that we have kind of the corridor highlighted in a yellow which is the existing dinky line running between Princeton and Princeton Junction Station. But you will also notice on that map, a larger multimodal connectivity study area. And early on in this process, uh, everybody on the project team recognized that there's really a opportunity here to leverage this great resource, this corridor that we have. is a great resource for mobility, but leverage that to enhance mobility outside of the corridor in West Windsor and in Princeton. So that's why we have that uh, secondary multimodal connectivity study area. <clears throat> Some of the project goals include improving the quality, frequency, and span of service. So really that in turn is going to help us to generate additional ridership on the corridor, meet other goals like reducing VMT, reducing vehicle emissions overall by encouraging additional use of transit. Enhancing connectivity between multi multiple modes, uh, whether it's walking, biking, other transit modes, as well as any service on the Dinky Line itself. Incorporating new and emerging technology. So in the, in the future, as, as uh, technology for, for example, autonomous operations become more available, we want the corridor to be able to accommodate for that. We want to also provide flexibility and scalability in the service so that if there are events, say, for example, in downtown Princeton is having an event, that, that service can be increased Sub, uh, appropriately to handle that additional traffic to and from the event. Why is the study needed now? Well, it's needed for several re reasons. First one being that, that the current uh, rail vehicles that are utilized on the corridor are aging. Uh, they are becoming more expensive to maintain. It leads to uh, higher maintenance costs, also operational reliability issues. So. There are eight, the raging, aging rail vehicles is, is one of the main uh, needs for this study. The, uh, the NJ Transit is currently replacing rail vehicles throughout its system, but they're replacing them with uh, multi-level unit cars, which many of you've seen probably if you've ridden the Northeast Corridor, and those have to run in consists of at least three cars. And uh, there are significant operational challenges due to that on the Princeton branch. First of all, the ridership doesn't support, uh, likely would not support uh, such a high number of, of seats on in the operation, the expensive operation of these rail vehicles. And um, they would, uh, the platforms are shorter and cannot accommodate the three car concept. So there's a variety of challenges, which don't make the new NJ Transit rail vehicles very appropriate for this corridor. We also have experienced declining ridership, and we'll talk about that in, in a few more slides that declining ridership started prior to the pandemic. So it's been ongoing even, even before the pandemic. There's also changing demands for transportation that have been evolving prior to the pandemic, and the pandemic has obviously had also a big impact on how and when and why people need to travel. We need to be able to accommodate that more effectively. And there's also new potential demand along the corridor, be it from the, potent, the future West Windsor TOD or the additional uh, expansion of the Princeton University campus on the east side of the lake. There's uh, opportunities here for additional uh, demand and thus needing some potentially some additional connections along the corridor. We are approaching the end of the study. We started back in spring of 2021, where we went over the existing conditions and constraints. 
We followed that up with a stakeholder meeting. The stakeholder group consisted of a variety of representatives from municipalities and other agencies. Uh, we also, NJ Transit also conducted a rider survey of this point of Dinky Riders. From that, using that information, we developed our conceptual alternatives. We evaluated those concept, began our preliminary evaluation of those conceptual alternatives and came right into the second stakeholder meeting, which occurred at the end of fall 2021, where we presented the preliminary, preliminary alternatives to the stakeholders. In addition to that, there was a, an, another rider survey that was more, uh, that was posted on the site and it was, you could go on and you could view the stakeholder presentation, components of the stakeholder presentation. And then the survey was asking people how they felt about the various options. Hopefully some of you that are on the call today uh, were able to participate in that survey. Then taking that information, we refined uh, the operational concepts. And now we're in the approaching the final stages where we have a preliminary preferred alternative. We're here to talk about that and present that to everyone on the call today and obtain some feedback and answer some questions. And then we'll be wrapping up uh, the study. During the existing conditions assessment, we tapped into a lot of resources in addition to the stakeholder uh, committee uh, to identify what some of the key issues are. And, and you know, one of the main key issues with the service as it exists today is that the ridership has been trending down even before the pandemic. You can see the chart on the top right of the screen, which shows a pretty substantial drop in ridership that coincided uh, relatively closely with the new, new, parking, new parking opportunities opening up at the Princeton Junction Station. Uh, and why does that affect ridership? Well, it really affects ridership because if we have more available parking at Princeton Junction, it makes it easier to drive to Princeton Junction. And given that the existing Princeton station is outside uh, acceptable walking distance from downtown Princeton, from many residents that live in the Princeton area, it became easier for a lot of people rather than to, to drive, say, to the Princeton station, then take the, the train to Princeton Junction, then board the Princeton, a train at Princeton Junction. Now there, it's easier for them to um, to just drive straight to the Princeton Junction Station, and there's a variety of reasons for that. One, just having the ample parking, but also the service on the Dinky Line, because it's a single track. It's and we you can, we can only operate uh, up to 30 minute headways on that track segment, and it wasn't it's not really lining up very well with the arrival and departure of the trains on the Northeast Corridor. So another reason why it, people were more encouraged just to to drive to the Princeton Junction Station. So in addition to those issues, we also saw overlapping transit services, but with even though we have overlapping services in some areas, we still see gaps in connectivity in other areas, both within West Windsor as well as within Princeton. We have that institutional growth and potential TOD and a potential for additional TOD along the corridor. And uh, there's a demand again for enhanced mobility. We got to start rethinking travel from the typical commuter. The commuter is obviously going to be an important component to travel in the future, but commuting is gonna be different for folks. We need to start thinking broadly about mobility. So not just people going to and from work, people needing to go to appointments, people needing to access different areas of Princeton and West Windsor. We have to think about how we can enhance mobility as through this project for uh, various reasons of travel. During the first survey, uh, we heard from riders basically echoing a lot of the things you would expect, an interest in enhanced reliability and frequency, improved access to downtown Princeton, as well as other residential areas along the corridor. There was significant interest in a pedestrian and bicycle connection along the corridor. And the other interesting thing to note, which, which I show right here, is even though we were surveying folks that were utilizing uh, the, um, the Princeton branch pre-pandemic, 76% of the respondents said that they had used it less a few times a month or less. This was pre-pandemic. So again, I think it's it's showing that their the ridership here is not is not something that is consistent on a daily basis. So again, it really describes that need to start rethinking how we can how we can make this corridor more useful for the people that live and work along the corridor. So here's a, this is the study corridor map, which we'll be talking about for most of the presentation. We have the existing Dinky line, which is running between Princeton University and Princeton Junction. 
And um, within that segment, there are some various alternatives, which we'll discuss, as well as each of the alternatives that we'll discuss have a potential parallel pedestrian and bicycle pathway, which would pro provide connections, for example, to the DNR Canal Trail, the Dinky Line Trail. In addition to the, the pedestrian and bicycle pathway, there are two potential new stations that could be uh, incorporated into all of the uh, all of the alternatives, which we're showing here as a Canal Point Boulevard station. So one on the west side of Route 1 and one on the east side of Route 1. In addition to that, you can see the dotted blue line. If you can see my cursor that goes into Princeton. And this is what we're calling a route, uh, our, our, our potential transit extension. So the idea behind a transit extension is that it, it will allow people to have a one seat ride from um, potentially their residents you know, in uh, that if they live along the, the station area or if they're working, they can have a one seat ride from there all the way along the full length of the corridor. And one seat rides are very important for enhancing, uh, enhancing ridership, make services a lot more attractive to the users. You can see we have, we evaluated a potential route extension into Princeton. Again, this is not at all a final route selection. It's just an example route that we evaluated to determine how providing this extension into Princeton, for example, would enhance ridership for the overall corridor. And again, you can see down here, we have that we call out the potential future extension as well of, uh, into, um, into West Windsor as well. The interesting, uh, the important thing to note about these extensions is that we're only talking about rubber tire vehicles, and I'll talk about what those vehicles are in a moment. We're only, we're not uh, looking at any rail extensions in either direction, into Princeton or into West Windsor. So uh, this slide is showing our three uh, preliminary alternatives. We have three build alternatives, one, two, and three, and they have, and we'll talk about those in a second, but I also want to highlight alternative four, which is the no build. The no build is a very important component of any alternatives analysis. It represents what would happen in the future uh, if we were maintaining existing service. So we have pr three prelim preliminary alternatives that we evaluated, and I'm going to kind of give a spoiler alert right away in, in this presentation and, uh, and say that alternative one is is the one that is going to be recommended to advance. So I just want to throw that out there. But we're going to talk. I'm going to talk everybody through how we arrived at that decision. And so alternative one includes a is a dedicated transit roadway with embedded light rail. So essentially, along the existing Dinky corridor, we would be constructing a two lane or two way um, uh, roadway that would be used by the rubber tire vehicles, BRT vehicles. And it would have embedded rail for a light rail style rail service. Alternative two is somewhat similar to alternative one, except that in alternative two, we are separating out the rail. So the rail is not part of the roadway. It's a separate, um, it's separate from the roadway. And so the cross section is much larger. In alternative three, that would be a dedicated transit roadway only. So only a rubber tire BRT service there would be no rail component as part of alternative three. Each of the three alternatives include a lot of the same components though, including additional stops, both along those extension segments, as well as on uh, along the Dinky corridor itself. It includes continuous, uh, a continuous connection between Princeton Junction and downtown Princeton. It includes a parallel pedestrian and bicycle corridor, as well as other safety enhancements on the route and amenities at stations. And it would also require a new maintenance facility for the new vehicles. The no build alternative would, we're essentially looking at the existing conditions. So maintaining the same service frequency that exists today, there would be no parallel pedestrian and bicycle corridor, or although we would be evaluating complete street concepts on Alexander Road and Washington Road. And in terms of the vehicles, we'd be maintaining the, likely maintaining the existing vehicle stock. And if it was determined in the future that maintenance of the existing vehicle st stock was not possible, a similar rail vehicle may have to be acquired. Oh, the other important thing I want to call out is that all of the alternatives are looking for the, at at only looking at the use of electric vehicles for both the rail and rubber tire. NJ Transit is, 
is moving very quickly to uh, upgrading all of its bus fleet over the next uh, 10 or 20 years for to all uh, electric power. You know, it's, it does re helps reduce vehicle emissions and keep noise significantly lower than a traditional diesel powered bus. In addition to looking at uh, the corridor and the transit service, we also wanted to look at this idea of mobility in West Windsor and Princeton. And one of the ways we accommodate that is through thinking of stations along the corridor as mobility hubs. So being able to tie in micro mobility and active modes, as well as other modes such as, you know, Uber Lyft, uh, personal vehicle drop off, other transit services like bus transit or shuttles. Um, and we wanna make sure we accommodate that at different stations. And so we developed a hierarchy for analysis in this study of the different types of stations from a primary hub, which would be our Princeton Junction station all the way down to the local stations. And there's various levels of amenities starting with a local station, which would have, you know, it's bicycle and scooter parking, as well as the potential for some real-time departure and arrival information, all the way up to a primary hub, which would, which would contain a lot more um, amenities because we'd expect a lot more concentration of users at these locations, things like, uh, day use lockers, potential uh, climate controlled seating areas, uh, e-scooter and e-bike charging, pump and tool stations for bicycles, those types of things at some of our more major stations. Some of the vehicle features that, that are being assumed as part of this analysis are level boarding. It's very important just not only for everybody to be able to access the vehicles efficiently, but also for ADA. Electric propulsion, as I said before, so either uh, you know catenary or battery power, a branded service, so everybody knows this is the corridor. They recognize both the vehicle branding as well as the station branding. Onboard amenities like Wi-Fi and the potential incorporation of future automated operations. Next, we're going to compare some cross sections of the corridor at various points. Both of these are on the east side of Route 1. So the first one we're going to look at is if you were standing on the east side of Route 1 on the track, let's say, looking back towards the bridge over Route 1, these are the cross sections that you would see for each of the alternatives. And so the alternatives 1 and 3 are very similar in that their, prof their footprint is relatively the same. Um, on the kind of on the uh, east side, or I guess this would be the north side of the tracks along the Penn's Neck neighborhood, pretty much nothing would change in terms of the um, of the right of way, of the north side of the right of way. We would you know, there would still be you know a, a buffer that exists currently in this section. We have trees. There's actually a park on this side, and so that right of way would remain essentially the same on that side of the tracks. You could see here in the middle alternatives one and two include that busway alternative, or sorry, alternatives one and three include the cartway you can see here. And then alternative one has the addition of the embedded rail. And because of the rail, we separated out the shared use path a little bit more than in alternative one than in alternative three. And so some right of way uh, may be required in certain areas on the south side of the tracks. Um, however, in general, alternatives one and, and three stay generally within the existing right of way. Alternative two in this area is, is, is somewhat similar, although you can, def, you can see the difference here where we have the rail in its current location, but then going on the north side of, that, of those tracks is where we, where we have the busway. You can, so you can tell the difference about how the cross section affects the north side of the track in particular. Moving further down, further towards the Princeton Junction station, if you were standing um, uh, uh, on the track adjacent to Fieldston Road, you know, where the Fieldston Road comes pretty close to the tracks there in that one section. Uh, and you were looking back towards, back towards Route 1. These are the different cross sections you would see. So alternatives 1 and 3 stay within the existing right-of-way. Um, but alternative 2, as you can see here, if we were to place the station in this location, Obviously, it wouldn't make sense because you can see it extends into Fieldston Road. That wouldn't make much sense. So actually, in alternative two, the rail station would have to be relocated a little bit to the uh, west. But again, you can see the much larger profile of alternative two, and that's really why alternative two was dismissed. 
the right of way impact would have been pretty substantial for uh, not not significant benefit over alternatives one or three. So now moving into some of the features of the corridor, especially as we're talking about how do we transition the service onto the local street network. So if the rubber tire vehicles are on that corridor, on the dinky corridor, but well, what happens when we get to either end? So on the Princeton side of things, uh, we're talking about uh, additional features on the roadway network to enhance circulation of the transit vehicles. This includes transit signal priority at some of those key intersections, branded stations. So taking that branding that we see on the corridor and moving it into those extensions so that people recognize the service. We're also looking at things like flexible lanes for transit priority during peak periods. What that means is that you know, maybe in the AM peak period, for example, some of the on-street parking is restricted so that buses can, can use that essentially as a bus lane. And level boarding platforms uh, is, an, is another key component of our in-town segments. This slide is showing an example of, of that branding and of that overall design at a potential Nassau Street station on Nassau Street in downtown Princeton. You can see a lot of the components, the level boarding platform, a distinctive design. This certainly is not the final design by any means. It's just an example of a type of branding design that could be applied throughout the corridor. Some features like bike parking, we have a real-time information. You can also see the type of vehicle that we would be talking about. So a rail style vehicle, but it's rubber tire, it's BRT. It's not, it's not a rail vehicle. In terms of how we tie the corridor onto uh, into Princeton, on the Princeton side, there's a few different options we're looking at. Options one and two are evaluating, utilizing the existing driveways so that the rubber tire vehicles can transition from the, uh, from the corridor onto the, the roadway network. And then option three down here is showing um, a potential option where we would extend the existing roadway for transit vehicles only along the former uh, Princeton line. So if you remember before the Princeton station was relocated, it was actually over in this area, further to the west of the drawing here. And uh, so we would reclaim some of that right of way back and it would allow buses to access the uh, corridor more, more efficiently than if they had to come down, go through the Alexander Road uh, traffic circle and there's some other, there's a traffic signal. So that this would provide obviously more efficient service, but again, it has, has impacts to the university. Here's, an, here's a uh, potential rendering of what the Roselle Road Station would look like in alternative one. You can see that distinctive design that would be echoed throughout. You could see here, the this is in alternative one. If you remember, that's where we have the roadway with embedded rail. So this is showing a light rail vehicle operating on the corridor. And then again, tying it in on the Princeton Junction side, there's various options that we can include to, how, uh, to determine how we can connect the, uh, the BRT service into the station area, as well as the LRT service. So one of, this is just showing one of the options where the L, existing LRT would follow the existing tracks and it would utilize the existing platform that, it, uh, that the dinky currently utilizes. The rubber tire vehicles, so the BRT vehicles would come uh, off of the corridor itself on a new roadway that would align essentially with this existing station drive. Buses could circulate through the parking area to some new drop-off points and then circulate either back onto the transit corridor or extend up into the potential future West Windsor TOD, or they could even head up the station drive and access 571. So there's various options as, the, as these plans evolve and get further along in the process that, uh, that could be evaluated. This is, uh, this, um, I just wanna reiterate that this is a, the initial planning study. So this is, this is just looking at concepts and evaluating trade-offs and coming up with an alternative that we would like to examine further and, and, and potentially move forward into more of an of a in-depth analysis and potentially preliminary design. So after, uh, we came, after we developed these concepts, we talked with the stakeholders, then we had the public survey. So the public survey, <clears throat> excuse me, the second public survey, I should say, was posted on the, web, on the project website and allowed folks to view the presentation slides 
look at the different alternatives and then rank the alternatives. So as we can see in the chart here, that alternative one was ranked number one by, by most, while alternative three was actually ranked most preferred by the fewest number of the lowest percentage. Some of the things that folks liked about alternative one included the new pet bike path, the connection to downtown, the service frequency and the service type. I think alternative one appealed to both folks that were looking for uh, enhanced connections into the community, into downtown Princeton, uh, as well as the surrounding residential areas, as well as those folks that were interested in a, maintaining a rail service. We conducted a preliminary evaluation to rank the alternatives on a variety of different uh, measures, different criteria, including peak period frequency, how well it enhanced connections to the community, equity, mobility access, right of way impacts, potential environmental impacts, uh, impacts to existing transit cost and uh, stakeholder and public input. We, evaluate, we ranked the uh, each alternative, including the no build based on uh, one, a scale of one to five with one being a low benefit or a very high negative impact, five being a high benefit or a low negative impact. So for example, on alternative two, you can see here on potential right of way impacts that it received a one as, as a low ranking because obviously there is some pretty substantial potential right of way impacts with alternative two because of the, uh, the separation of the rail from the from the from the busway. So taking that information in, uh, our recommendations as part of this study is to advance alternative one, which is a dedicated transit roadway with embedded rail. Uh, we want to advance that because it's the most favorable based on the survey. It was the highest ranked based on the alternatives analysis. It meets the project purpose need and goals while minimizing property and environmental impacts. Uh, and then we also alternative four also has to come along throughout the uh, next stages of the project. It is the no build, it is required for EA and EIS process, but it's also important to keep evaluating uh, the alternative one as it advances further against the, the no build condition. Our next steps are to hear from you today. We heard from Princeton about two weeks ago and we have another stakeholder a meeting with our stakeholder group coming up next week. We're gonna take all that uh, feedback that we receive. We're gonna make any minor adjustments to the alternatives that we feel appropriate. But in general, these, are, these alternatives that you see today are going to uh, are, are going to stay essentially the same. There might be little tweaks. We're gonna issue a final study and report. And then from there, uh, this, this study is over. There's potential for additional preliminary design work, but that's uh, to be determined at the moment. Uh, there's, no, there's no set timeline for, for when that preliminary work would occur. And on, on top of that, uh, we would look to uh, the municipalities to, as this project advances to the next stages, to begin thinking about how we can leverage this by uh, looking at connecting pedestrian and bicycle facilities. For example, the alternatives that have the pedestrian and bicycle pathway, how can we connect into that pedestrian and bicycle pathway from the surrounding community? And also municipalities could beginning look, begin looking at TOD supportive zoning. The potential new stations, particularly at Roselle Road and at Canal Point Boulevard uh, provide opportunities on the south side of the tracks to look at how we can utilize um, some of that underutilized space uh, especially around the Roselle Road Station. So on the north side of Alexander Road in that area, we have a lot of commercial buildings, um, underutilized space that could potentially be looked at for TOD in the future. So P TOD supporting, supportive zoning will be critical to enhancing that, uh, that opportunity. So with that, um, be happy to turn it back over uh, for questions. Uh, let's see. We are going to go first to our invited groups. Um, so let's see. Um, from the Environmental Commission, um, I believe we have someone from the Environmental Commission on the call, and I've unmuted your um, I've unmuted you if you have anything you'd like to say. Yes. Uh, hello, this is Efrem Books. I'm a chair of the Environmental Commission of West Windsor 
uh, Township. And I'd like uh, to thank you very much for your presentation. But specifically, we would like you to address the environmental impact of the changes, particularly in West Windsor Township. So the issues are, uh, and I looked at your rating and I found that uh, the uh, one of the uh, proposed um, system would probably, here we go. That's right, thank mm -hmm. you very much. So you can see environmental impact, alternative four is five. I assume nothing changes, so it stays the way. Mm -hmm. But alternative one you're looking at certainly will be decreased from five to three. So I'd like you to specifically address that issue from environmental point of view. I also would like to ask you about um, not re related questions, whether you're planning to use solar energy in any way, like putting solar panels everywhere, particularly new parking um, you know, structures, uh, please talk about recharging stations, addressing electrical vehicles, and in general, autonomous um, uh, train a system. Would you consider because some townships in the United States already started to implement that it was already built in West Germany in Hamburg by Siemens? Uh, I think those are my major issues. The next one would be not related to environmental, but what's the cost of any of the projects that you, alternatives that you looked at, how the cost would be covered and how it would affect West Windsor Township residents. Thank you. Okay, hi, can you guys hear me? I'm, I'm Lou Milan from NJ Transit Planning. Uh, you, you've got a lot in that question. I'm gonna to try to remember everything. Uh, in the, All right, uh, I, will, I would lead you if, if you'd like. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so, so regarding the, you, you mentioned uh, electric vehicles, everything uh, that we're planning here will be electric. Um, uh, and whether it's a, a steel wheeled, like a rail vehicle, or a rubber tired vehicle. Uh, we are envisioning a, an emissions free system. Uh, it is possible in fact that the vehicles, uh, we may consider a type of vehicle where it almost doesn't look that much different. Uh, an articulated vehicle where whether it's rubber tired or steel wheeled uh, or the class of vehicle may, may look the same. That, 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 that's possible, I can't say for sure, uh, but it is one of the aims. But no matter what, everything will be uh, electric uh, and non-emitting and quiet. Um, uh, regarding environmental impacts, uh, I'm gonna let, um, I'll, I'll defer to an extent to, to Adam who might be able to speak a little bit more uh, about it. But uh, with the no-build alternatives, yes, it gets rated highest because nothing changes. So we don't have to put a shovel in the ground. We don't have to do anything. If we convert the right of way from something that's uh, set up for heavy rail to uh, something that's set up for light rail that's embedded in, in asphalt. Obviously we've got to put a shovel in the ground and do a little bit of work. The footprint really doesn't change, uh, but there will be some mild impacts. Um, it's important to understand that, that this is the beginning of a process, uh, the, the planning process. So step one is alternatives analysis and you have to conduct that and you've got to do it in a way that's compliant with the federal process in order to be able to qualify for future future federal capital funding. Um, we don't do that, we won't qualify for federal capital funding and most projects advance with a combination of federal and state capital funding. So we're trying to follow that process. Now what that process does though is early on, we, we do this sort of look at everything that's possible. That's why we have uh, three new alternatives plus no build. Uh, and then make some determinations about what, what's feasible, what's not, what has impacts. And you move forward with the feasible option, which is why, again, we're looking at uh, alternative one. At this point, where this is just a study, uh, if, we, if we are able to identify funding in the future, we'll be able to extend this to, to, to 
some early design and, and potentially some sort of environmental assessment, but we're not there yet. We're at the very beginnings of the, of the planning stage where we are looking at what is possible in this corridor? What would a new transit system look like? How does it meet local needs and desires? Uh, and, and what at a high level do we think is feasible? That's what this, this, this current study is about. So did I miss anything? No, you covered a lot. Would you consider autonomous vehicles? Oh, good. That's right. You mentioned that. So we we have we certainly are, and the, the intention is to set up a system that can facilitate a future implementation of autonomous vehicle when the technology is ready and safe and proven to implement in passenger service. Uh, we can't implement what isn't there right now, but we are trying to set the stage for a future autonomous operation. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, I guess I can really quickly jump in and, and talk about the environmental impact. So, uh, you know, at, like with, uh, as Lou had mentioned, yes, alternative uh, four, which is the no build, everything stays the same. So we're, we're comparing the environmental impact in terms of things like wetland impact, flood hazard areas, things like that. Uh, and so alternatives, obviously the build alternatives have a little bit of an impact on those items because we're expanding the corridor. Al Al alternative two, which has a much wider cross section, is gonna have a much more significant impact. Alternative one, for example, um, you know, our preliminary uh, assessment identified about, uh, I believe off the top of my head, it was around 500 square feet of wetland impacts and about a uh, half acre of flood area impacts. So not significant, but still measurable. It's still impacting some areas that were not are not impacted under the no build condition. So we wanna make sure that we properly account for that. Another area that, that needs uh, substantial evaluation is stormwater because we are in the DNR canal area. They have, uh, the commission has uh, relatively stringent uh, rules when it comes to stormwater management and with additional paved surface, both for the transit way as well as the pet bike trail, um, there, are, there are impacts associated with that. And, and so we'll be looking at green stormwater management and other opportunities to meet those, meet those uh, requirements. I think it's fair um, address. Uh, would you also consider planting trees, putting pollinator gardens and uh, rain gardens to control a flood flooding situation? I, I think that would be something that could be explored in the future. That's probably a little bit detailed for this level of study at the moment, but. Um, Do you? you know, to anticipate reducing number of trees planted there? Uh, we did not do any sort of, uh, uh, of a deforestation assessment to identify how many trees would have to be removed. As that would come in later stages. Okay. Thank you very much for your comments. Okay, so uh, the next group we have identified is the West Windsor Parking Authority. Um, let's see, I believe we have two people from the parking authority on and I've allowed both of them to talk. Hey everybody, I think it's just me for now. I'm Scott, I'm with the West Windsor Parking Authority. I was interested in um, knowing what the potential impact for the alternatives would be on the Princeton Junction Station, especially in terms of how many parking spaces would have to be removed for uh, the new roadways for to adjust for the trainways. Uh, yeah, let me go back to. So you can see, like for example, in this option here, um, we would have to redistribute some of the parking that would be lost in this area where this roadway is coming through, um, and reallocate potentially reallocate that. I, I, you know, I think it's something that we can be. A, you know, we've identified, and I, I can't recall off the top of my head exactly how many parking spaces would uh, would potentially be lost uh, for this. But I think at the same time, it's important to think about this as as potentially enhancing transit service, so that uh, you know maybe parking demand would not be as high as it maybe was pre-pandemic. 
uh, and maybe there could be better use of, or maybe not need to to replace the uh, limited amount of parking that's lost because of some of the options at the West Windsor station. Okay, and looking and at to, to, to just cut in real quick, uh, Crystal Lee with transit. Okay. Um, hey, Scott, <laughs> good, to, good to hear from you. Um, I think it's important to emphasize on something that Lou mentioned as well, like prior that, you know, all of what we're showing here, and you might hear it ad nauseum, but, you know, it is the truth to a lot of these more target specific questions that we might field. Um, these are all visual representations of the concepts that we're trying to represent. Um, so you can sort of put a name to a face, if you will, as far as what the alternatives would look like in practice. So, um, you know, whatever is represented uh, should not be considered final. Um, everything is purely conceptual. Um, there's still a lot of further design work, a lot more community input, um, you know, municipal level staff input, you know, all of the pertinent people who need to be involved. There's still much more conversation, research and information gathering before, you know, we can firmly commit to X amount of spaces um, will be taken here. Um, you know, as, as far as actual impacts to properties, um, you know, nothing, nothing is, is, is set in stone outside of what we have already committed to with alternative two, which is um, not, you know, taking anybody's property for that alternative, it was dismissed. So outside of, you know, those firm decisions that we've made as far as which alternatives to proceed on, everything is, is, is purely at a conceptual level and still needs to be worked through before uh, final proposals are made. Okay. Yeah, my main, as soon as I saw this image, my main thought was on the BRT circulation path, the main section of Alexander, I can do a rough estimate on how much it would be to take out, so that would have me slightly concerned. And then I'm guessing the dinky platform would have to be lowered for the new plan, and probably the dinky waiting room would be replaced. I know this is all conceptual, but from what was described, was that what you guys were thinking? Yeah, yeah, it's it's possible, but that would all be to be determined. And I can speak to your first point, Scott, that, you know, any type of estimates, any type of um, numbers, considerations that, you know, you might have that you think either may be impacted or could be a potential benefit for us to have on hand as things proceed. Um, we would love to have that information, estimates, projections. That's that's something that would just only serve to enhance the study. Okay. I can shoot you over those numbers um, so you guys can take a look at it. I don't want to scare you by saying it out loud just yet. So, it would be much appreciated. <laughs> okay. Um, and yeah, that was basically it for me. Um, to be honest, our our concern always lies with just the Princeton Junction Station as far as my organization. So um, I'm parking authority. It's my first thought is parking. So um, that's basically it for me, unless you guys have anything you want me to answer. <laughs> Many thanks, Scott. Thanks. No, thank you. Um, let's see, the next group we have is the West Windsor Bicycle and Pedestrian Alliance. And I believe we have Dave Robinson. I'm allowing him to talk. Yep, I'm here, gentlemen. Uh, thank you for including us in this meeting. Um, everyone hearing me okay? Yes. Yep. Okay, good. Um, well, I must say the, the West Windsor Bike and Pedestrian Alliance, uh, uh, one of our um, biggest items on the wish list is the shared use path that's going from the stations into Princeton. Um, and I know uh, the presenter uh, couched everything in, well, these are our ideas. And obviously when we get down to the detailed planning, uh, things will all shake out and maybe or maybe not. Um, in all honesty, it would be, I think, a travesty if that bike path, that shared path was dropped. Um, it, Mercer County is doing a trials uh, trails initiative whereby they want to extend a lot more uh, biking and pedestrian use. Um, as shown currently, this would link to the DNR 
uh, trail um, and on into Princeton and out <clears throat> on into the, uh, you could certainly get to the Sourlands, etc. cetera. Um, and, and so really it should, <laughs> it should be uh, added if at all possible. Um, and, and I'm also wondering if on, if it could be added to the option four, if heaven forbid we did nothing. I don't know if that's, I mean, obviously that would increase the budget of option four. Um, so uh, this is Lou from transit. Um, uh, bike pet access to transit, safe access, and in this case also alongside transit is, is just part of our planning uh, here and elsewhere, wherever it's feasible. Uh, we purposely included uh, bike pet access in this plan because uh, it would obviously make a large difference. We know there's an interest in it. We know it's feasible here. And our intention is to continue to include it in our planning. Um, there was another part of your question and I'm trying to remember what it was. Including it in alternative four. Alter well, that, then, then it's not a no build. Uh, the no build alternative has to remain. That's, that's, trend, that's as it is. Uh, uh, adding something like that would be a standalone project. Uh, no build in an alternatives analysis is no build. It's that simple. But there, there, so, but you would, uh, if you had a no build, then you'd be still running the current old rolling stock, or is your no building is really a right. well? Yeah. So do you remember the summer that the first Star Wars movie came out? Summer 77, all you heard on the, the radio was the Bee Gees, Saturday Night Fever. Remember that summer? That's the summer that the rolling stock first went into service. And so it's going to get to the end. Uh, not too many vehicles of any sort from 1977 are still on the road today. It's a big part of the reason that we're undertaking this study. We've got this, uh, this rail vehicle with a, with a really hard and fast expiration date of real soon where we've got to do something about it. And this study gives us the opportunity to look at doing more in the corridor. Uh, that's why no build isn't so great. Uh, hopefully we won't resort to that. Okay, <laughs> let's hope. Um, I mean, if you did do the, uh, the shared use path, would, we, would it be lit um, along the way? Uh, and I suspect this uh, impacts on uh, my environmental colleague earlier uh, in terms of you know, what sort of road surface you would be putting on for the shared use, whether it be um, you know, uh, semi-permeable and, and things like that. We would have to work all of that out. Uh, right. That's the later design in terms of the, the configuration and the materials used in, in the parallel pathway. Uh, the idea, though, is to facilitate that sort of access to and alongside the transit way. But all the and, details would get worked out later. Right. You have, uh, I know there are some notes in the uh, presentation that says uh, uh, that the path is off of the ROW. Um, do you right know how much there is approximately in percentage terms? Uh, it's only in a certain, a few certain locations, um, and it's it could be. Uh, it's usually just at most a few feet. Um, you know, if, for example, here we're probably in this slide here we're probably was that eight feet over, but further down we're only a few feet, and in other places we're not at all. So we do have a overall corridor. You know plan view and and we've accounted for all those locations but it's just in certain pieces it's, it's not really continuous and there may be opportunities in the design to shift some of the components around to keep it more inside and more inside the right of way but we're trying to hold uh, we're essentially trying to hold the north side of the right of way where it is whenever possible and uh, and so sometimes on the south side the path does go out but a lot of that is is in the some of that's on university property uh some of that's within public right of way and and um so it's it's kind of a hard question just to answer 
right off the bat, but right now it's it would be relatively small, sh likely strip takings, no full full property acquisition of any any sort. I mean, I did notice that it, it, on that diagram you have displayed that you've got a a, a five foot bio swell uh, between the train and the the bike path, basically. Um, whereas you don't have that so much on the others. Like uh, alternative two, you don't have a bike swell, uh, bio swell at all. Just, yeah, well, exactly. And, and that's why we're just trying to show different options when we're doing our evaluations okay. of the alternatives. You know, when you get into design, you know, we, we would probably look to minimize uh, right of way uh, takings whenever possible. Mm -hmm. And by, like you said, potentially reducing bioswale, but that also has to be traded off with the stormwater requirements. So there's a lot of things yeah. that, that have to be balanced. And so we were just trying to display a variety of options. Understand. Um, okay. Um, well, I, 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 I thank you for your presentation and uh, hopefully I'm, we'll still be around when it's finally completed. Thank you. Okay, our next group uh, that was invited is the West Windsor Friends of Open Space. Um, and Allison, I've uh, allowed you uh, permission to talk on the, the call if you're in, if you have interest or questions. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you for your uh, presentation. And I thank everyone else for their questions. Uh, I'm representing Friends at West Windsor Open Space, but uh, previously I have been on uh, the Bike and Ped Alliance in all of this. Um, I have just some um, comments. Early on, you showed a, um, an option three in using the existing right of way. And you, you showed how you could um, run the new trains all all the way to the previous uh, Dinky station in Prince. I thought right of way made a lot of sense. And people who used to feel comfortable taking the Dinky to Princeton Junction could do it again. Um, I'm very interested in having people from downtown Princeton to Princeton Junction on uh, um, Allison, we're unfortunately we're losing you a bit. Transit. I will have to. If you do, um, will you need to create wetlands? Um, I don't know what to do to make myself more audible. Um, I am curious as to whether you will have to create wetlands uh, I know you'll have to plant trees. And if you can't hear me, I don't know what to do. Now, I, th I turned off my camera to hopefully save some bandwidth, but I think I, I got the first question was um, about this slide that is on my screen now where we show that potential, a little bit of a reclamation of the potential former uh, right of way. Uh, this would actually, we, we're not actually proposing to extend the rail, and this would just be for the rubber tire vehicles to connect more efficiently uh, 
into downtown Princeton. Um, and this obviously would require significant coordination with the university. We have, and I think that it's an option, but um, it, it it definitely needs a lot of additional coordination. Um, and then the second question was about replacement of trees and wetlands. Um, unfortunately, I'm not great at answering that question. I'm not an environmental engineer, and I think that's possibly a little bit too detailed for this level of analysis uh, in terms of how that how that how those things get mitigated well and i it's just a matter of concern to friends of west windsor open space because we are uh open space advocates uh, it, it seems to me that you have really two projects all at once one replacing BRT and the other is increasing the, uh, re the, the rent of it into downtown Princeton and maybe into downtown West Windsor. Uh, would all that be done at once or would it be done uh, in two phases? I, I guess in terms of the phasing, that would be that's still to be determined. There's certainly potential that that certain things could be done in different stages, but that really needs further determination as the study moves forward. Mike, sorry, I didn't know if you were going to. Yeah, I'm just going to talk about the environmental just a little bit. Um, two things. One is reforestation. We'd be required uh, to plant trees for reforestation requirements, and we would be required to mitigate wetlands per. Uh, the permits we had to acquire for the construction. There will be disturbance of wetlands and transition areas. That's unavoidable, unavoidable with everything except the no build. And uh, so there would be some, probably some, some wetland mitigation, which is creation of wetlands, uh, swales, vegetated swales, et cetera. And then reforestation would be the planting of trees and, and and, you know, again, at, at a concept level, we're just identifying that those are things we might have to do. We're not at the design point where we can actually uh, lay all that stuff out. That would come at a much later stage. Well, I'm sure you'll keep us posted on where you're going to reforest and where you're going to do your mitigation. Um, aside from that, uh, FOOS, like bike ped, are, is very good the, the um, pedestrian and bicycle uh, path across Route 1 on the, the Dinky uh, right-of-way. This has been very important to us for years and years, and that you're doing it is uh, a wonderful, wonderful thing. And um, we're grateful. But at this point, uh, I don't have any more questions. Thank you, Allison. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, now we're going to open this up to the Penn's Neck area resident questions. Um, let's see. I have uh, let's see of the um, hold on just a minute. Okay. On the, um, on the chat. Right. So I, I'm, I'm going to first, uh, we've got a question from uh, Isabella Palowicz. Um, I've opened your mic. Uh, you're welcome to talk. Hi, thank you for taking my question. Um, I, I'm going to read it. Uh, my name is Isabella Palovich. My property is located exactly where the New Jersey transit map designs. You have designed uh, the Rosedale station at 198 Mather Avenue in Princeton. Uh, Mayor Marate assured me in a previous conversation that my property is not going to be affected at all according to the preferred option chosen 
out of the four options. However, in the last Zoom webinar with, with the Princeton group, Mr. Adam Catherine mentioned it again, as well as actually today, as, um, as well as showed the visual of the Roselle station. My questions are, one, are you committing to not affecting the group of homes existing in Penn's Neck along the existing dinky? And my question number two, are you committing to erecting a sound slash privacy barrier between our homes and what is basically a thoroughway of four lanes of traffic? Um, I'm saying that because even last summer when you um, repaired the tracks, um, some days the noise was so enormous with all the, I mean, I'm all for everything, you know, but it just was unbearable some days, the noise of construction. So uh, my vote was for modernizing electric, in an electric version number four of your proposal, but um, I see that that is not um, a favorite option. Thank you. Okay, sorry, we're, we're getting there. Trying to make this work on a little laptop in the conference room. So there, this is Lou from Transit. Um, just to clarify, the, the alternative one is essentially two lanes, uh, one right of way with two lanes. So it's not four lanes of, of traffic. Uh, the vehicles that would operate would be all electric. Uh, so you know, a lot of people think about um, like the sound of a diesel bus. We've ordered it as a you know a bus pulls away. It's it's noisy. These aren't like that. Uh, the alternative that involved uh, the potential acquisition of residential properties is not being advanced. So there 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 is not going to be a, a need to acquire uh, any property on the residential side of the right of way. I mean, we we quickly discarded that. As I mentioned earlier, that's one of the the aspects of of um, doing this, this, this early action um, uh, alternatives analysis is that you gotta look at everything that's possible. And when you take that look and you determine the impacts, uh, then we, can, we have to make some decisions and, and identify those, those uh, alternatives that have impacts. Uh, and, and obviously we're looking to minimize impacts. And so, you know, the, the dismissing of the alternative two was, was uh, kind of an easy, easy decision. I can understand why folks would be alarmed, but but it isn't like that. Um, we we aren't going to be advancing uh, that alternative. Uh, you know, we're we're not at a stage where we can say what's really feasible. We haven't done detailed engineering. This is high level conceptual work. So you know, getting more of a sense about what what the right of way would look like and and. Even the existence of a station, this inclusion of stations was was hypothetical. Uh, one, one of the thoughts was uh, with a new transit service, it might be possible to, to serve some points along the line, right, as well as the end points. So whether there's a station, where there's a station, that would all have to be borne out in later analysis. Right now, this is high level conceptual work. So there's nothing definitive about you know, whether a station will exist at this location. And another quick thing I wanna mention was one of the reasons why you want to seek to provide as rich a transit service as you can is to reduce traffic. Uh, our goal is to try to get as many people onto transit as we can so that they don't have to be driving uh, through communities. Um, everything has impacts, including uh, new transit, but the idea is, again, to try to get people out of their cars and onto transit. So I hope that answered your question. Okay, let's see the next um, for anyone that wants to actually read their question or ask a, a question just in um, in voice, please raise your hand, click the button to raise your hand and we can acknowledge you and, and let you speak. Um, 
let's see, Mark Werner is the next in the list. Yes, hello, thank you for taking my question. Um, I'm actually Isabella's neighbor, uh, 211 Mather Avenue. And I know, I understand that, um, you know, there won't be any property acquisition with option number one, but I think what her main concern is, and I, I echo the same concerns is just overall, I guess, quality impacts to our residential spaces on Mather Avenue in particular, and also those in Fieldston as well. Um, looking at the diagram on alternative one, it looks like there's a 30 foot buffer between on the northbound side of the potential renovation. Is that correct? There will that be in the 30 feet from the existing green space along Mather Avenue, or will that be consumed by the existing green space? You're talking about this diagram right here. So that 30 foot buffer that we're showing in here on this segment. Um, so this is, uh, yeah, so th this is where the, there's a uh, West Windsor Township green space or, or park area. This is 30 foot. This is within the existing corridor right of way. So. Um, so that that line right there where you're hovering over that that's where the green space begins or is that. Well, right now, because we have a, the track is right here, kind of where this train is being shown. So all of this right now is forested. So there's no. Uh, I don't recall if there's a fence out here on the right of way line. Sometimes and there are fences along here, but uh, you know, this is, you know, all the way up to the tracks is pretty much, you know, forested green space. So sometimes when, when we don't have a definitive line of right of way, it's kind of hard to tell, okay, where is the, where is the right of way start and the, and the green space start. Uh, and so if you go out there today and there's no fence, which I, uh, I don't recall if there, I don't recall no. if there's a fence in this area. No fence. It, it kind of seems like all this one big area because you're getting you're getting what 43 feet before you get to the track bed uh and then that's within the right of way of the corridor itself but is actually right now you know you would go out there when it seemed like a continuous green space so if you think about where the track is now and you go and, and where the rail bed is today and you go back you know you know based on this diagram about 40 so feet um, you would have, you would go back 13 feet and that would be, you know, a uh, paved space. But then after that, that 30 feet of that 43 feet between the track and the existing right of way line would stay uh, as, as, as green space potentially. Now, there might be potential that we need to look at this area for, uh, you know, uh, green stormwater management, bioswales, things like that. Um, but it, as we're showing here, that would not be. Uh, wouldn't be, there wouldn't be a, you know, any hardscape in there. Okay, so so there would be some, as it stands right now, there'd be some removal of those existing quote unquote green space. Right, but that would be within the existing right of way. But like like I said, if you go out there today, it all just seems like one big area. So yes, there would there would be some some tree removal likely required to just provide this, uh, just provide the concept for alternative one, the, the roadway. Okay, because I know there are uh, also re referencing Isabella um, homes. I'm on the opposite side of Mather, but there are homes that border that track. I can't imagine it would seem like that with alternative one, that electric bus would be borderline in their backyards with that additional 13 feet of uh, development, right? Right. The right, right of way does get quite a bit more narrow in that section. Um, and so if you kind of look at this uh, diagram here at the top, I know this is where Fieldston Road is, but if you, if you think Fieldston Road, basically the edge of that is the existing corridor right of way. So there basically we would have about a 10 to 12 foot buffer between the lane of for the bus and the right-of-way line of the corridor so then people's backyards would start you know on this side of the right-of-way so we're not in we're not taking property away 
Um, right. But you're right. It, you know, things are would be moving a little bit closer. We'd still be able to maintain a, a, a bit of a buffer. But of course, things will this lane will be a little bit closer to those. I think there are four homes on that side. So you're correct, you're correct with that. So the, the, the question, I mean, the overall concern I would have would be, I understand, you know, there, when you say there's no right of way acquisitions, so there's not going to be any property acquisitions, but I mean, putting essentially a bus in someone's backyard makes that property, you know, I would imagine substantially depreciating value, right? Like, I mean, who wants to look out their back, their back window and see a bus going back and forth all day long? Uh, this is Lou from Transit. I certainly don't want it, but we aren't proposing uh, a, a regular bus like like people think about. Um, as I had mentioned earlier, we, we're proposing uh, electric vehicles that run either on steel wheels or rubber tires. Uh, it's a different kind of vehicle. Um, yeah, but any any bus, or any kind of vehicle would, would, would be less than ideal. I mean, I don't, I don't really want to see any kind of public transit essentially in my backyard, right? Like, who? I mean regardless of, of, of what, what, what fuel it runs off of or what kind of wheel it has. Well, that's, that's I mean, I, I, I understand, uh, you know, we're trying to address multiple uh, local preferences, uh, including, uh, you know, the preference for providing more frequent service. Uh, and regardless of the type of vehicle, there would be more uh, of them running. Uh, that's how to make it happen. So, uh, you know, our, our goal is to try to make it as least impactful as possible. Uh, and the, the, how that's worked out, though, and we, we're not at a point where we can get into detail. The, the thing is, it's, it's interesting that the diagrams don't, the road that you reference within Penn's Neck is Fieldston. But, but to me, the road that the road that you reference is also Mather as well, because I think Mather is actually closer to your proposal than Fieldston in terms of from, from a home perspective, because there, again, there are four homes located essentially that border the, the current track. We appreciate your feedback, Mark, um, and we will take note of it. And we appreciate the perspective and in building off everything that Lou just said, um, we will take that into account moving forward. Yeah, and during the design phase, perhaps there's uh, work that can be done to mitigate some of those concerns as you advance the design. Okay. Um, okay, now uh, let's see. We are we're um, close to time. I wanna make sure that everyone understands we will get answers to all the questions. Questions typed into the question and answer will be answered um, after, the, after the meeting's over if we don't get to any of those questions. So please make sure your questions are in the question and answer uh, sec section and not the chat. Um, and let's see, we'll, we'll work to get through as many questions as we can before the 6.30 end time of the meeting. Um, let's see, next we have up uh, Naomi Newman. Naomi? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, hi. Um, I live on 39 Fieldston Road, so I'm you know, two houses in from the Dinky track. Um, Penn's Neck is a transit transit oriented development. It, it was one before that term was even coined. I um, work in New York City. I've walked to the train um, at Princeton Junction for many, many years. And in fact, it's very walkable. I've done it in all kinds of weather. It takes about 15 minutes if you take the shortcut um, half of which is in the parking lot. So it's, it's really only a few minutes past, you know, the farther reaches of the Princeton Junction parking lot. So I, I totally um, support the comments of my neighbors, you know, regarding Mather and um, understanding that you're looking at option one, which wouldn't involve taking any homes. Um, I was glad to hear that that Roselle Road Station is hypothetical because you could really call it the Fieldston Road Station. It would be right across from many of our homes when in fact, it's very walkable from here to Princeton Junction. So when you consider, um, you know, this is a residential neighborhood, we, um, 
would have light pollution, I would imagine, from a, a train station that would operate, you know, well into the evening. We would have noise pollution of, of maybe not some not just the vehicles, but people, you know, using that station. We would have, you know, non-residents of our area perhaps dropping off, you know, to, to get to the train, you know, in our neighborhood, which we already have some of people parking here occasionally. So um, I, I really think you need to, um, I, I understand the value of having local stations in theory, but when you, when you get down to it, um, we are already very walkable to Princeton Junction. Um, and if we want to take the dinky into Princeton, we, we, walk five, we walk 15 minutes down to the junction and then um, take the dinky into Princeton. So um, really my question is, have you considered the impact on the residents of Fieldston Road, Mather Avenue, Coventry Circle, our whole, our whole area, when you think about positioning um, a station um, right adjacent to our neighborhood? This is Lou again from Transit. I'll, I'll uh, just state again that uh, the inclusion of those stations was hypothetical. Uh, and uh, whether anything moves forward and how it moves forward and what the impacts would be, uh, would be borne out in later stages of, of, uh, of design work. Uh, but at this point is simply just, just a concept and uh, it is not a, a commitment or a, a guarantee that there would uh, ever be a station there. Uh, you, you've got to start somewhere in the planning uh, process. And, you know, we, we, we hear a variety of uh, messages from folks, some of which who are supportive of this sort of station, others who are not. And the process uh, of, of, of planning would, in, would include that, that public input all along uh, at, before any determination was made about whether there would ever be a station there. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for your question. Okay, next up is Andre Geffen. You're uh, unmuted, or you're allowed to unmute. Uh, I'd like to start this off by thanking you for addressing this issue. So the current setup of the dinky is absolutely ridiculous, and I'm glad that work is now being done to address it. However, I do have a few questions. So um, first off, could you elaborate on the rationale for peak only EBS enhanced bus service lanes over 24 seven bus lanes? Well, why, why do they need to transition to parking when they aren't being used for buses? When they're uh, you're, oh, so you're referencing, let me go to that slide just so that people can see what we're talking about. Where was that slide? Um, well, anyways, I, I can. The, yeah, it was right there, right there, right before that a little. Yeah. Oh, yeah, sorry. I'm, I saw it, but then I didn't see the picture. Uh, <laughs> my apologies. So. I, I think when we're kind of what Lou was discussing on a lot of these issues is that when we're we're looking at our potential um, possibilities, we understand that in downtown Princeton, many of the uh, many of the vendor or many of the businesses there appreciate and uh, and appreciate the on-street parking. And so I think when we were taking a look at this, it, it, you know, we were talking about uh, peak period lanes in, in an effort to balance when we would need kind of the most, when we would like to have some of the most uh, a high efficiency service, because when we're, that's when we're likely experiencing a lot of the higher congestion on Nashville Street, for example, but balancing that with the needs and, and concerns of the businesses that, that lie along the street. So, you know, as we get further into the process, there may be a, uh, a push for full-time bus lanes. But at this stage, you know, this is just an option that we are looking at to identify ways that we could enhance service. So as, as Lou had mentioned before, you know, I think there's potential for things to be refined in further stages. Okay, I, I, have, I do have strong concerns about the peak hour transit lanes. First of all, I, I don't really believe people will move from them when it is time for the buses to use them. And second of all, Nassau Street is, and Witherspoon Street too, are generally congested for much of the day, much longer than just the peak hours. Um, but secondly, I do have a question. Will provisions such as like, you know, great, like keeping stuff level so that it could be adjusted in the future and clearances and so forth be put in place um, so that if in the future funding is allocated and there's community support uh, to have LR to have light rail on the proposed um, bus corridor, 
um, it, it would be able to be put into place. So like running it down, running light rail down University Place, NASA, Witherspoon, if in the future that is an idea. Uh, we're not, like I said, we're not evaluating any rail extensions as part of this project, but um, I don't see anything on the surface that would preclude the potential for that in the future, if that's something that somebody wants to look at down the line. All right. And but it's not my, part of this. And then my last question is that, are, are there going to be sidings installed along uh, the light rail corridor for increased frequencies? We do have a passing siding for increased frequencies that would lie to the west of Route 1. So starting on the west side of the Route 1 overpass, Alternative 1 does include a passing siding that's about a, a half a mile long that would allow for increased frequency by being able to use that passing track. And there's also a siding for that would go into the a potential maintenance facility, which would also potentially be located on the west side of the Route 1. Would the siding uh, run through, would the siding run through Canal Point Boulevard Station or would it um, it would. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. Next up is Sharon. Hello, I'm Sharon Sebelia and I live at 217 Washington Road. <clears throat> My house is across the street from Wilder. Um, so if you pull up the slide where you were showing um, I have two questions, one of which is um, if you'll pull up the slide that shows the Princeton Junction train station. Mm -hmm. oh, there we go. Okay, so currently there are um, approved 880 houses in the uh, future West Windsor section that's north of the tracks, mm -hmm. west of the tracks. Um, that um, means that there are potentially 880 or a thousand or more cars going onto Washington Road because the station drive is really a private road. Um, these people who planned this said they were going to get um, permission from you all to use the parking lot um, that you have, um, it's just south of them. Um, to connect their West Road, not Station Drive, but the other side, to um, the crossing um, so that people could go to Alexander. And I'm not sure that they actually have requested that or um, gotten that permission, but I was wondering how that affects the dinky um, traffic and um, if, they, if that is incorporated into this plan, because I don't see that. Hi, this is Chris from, from Transit. Uh, I don't want to speak for uh, West Windsor Township officials who are on the call, but this to me sounds like the proposed Vaughn Drive extension. Um, it's a temporary thing because they don't have time to get the Vaughn Drive extension, but yes, it's the Vaughn Drive extension. Yeah, so as far as a potential additional railroad crossing would uh, be in concerns like that would be a process that would have to be spearheaded initially um, by the township through New Jersey Department of Transportation as NJDOT has complete oversight over all railroad crossings, et cetera, throughout the state. Um, speaking as far as, you know, the potential incorporation into this plan, um, I think one of the, the good parts about, you know, the conceptual study that's been done to this point is that it's flexible. So, you know, we obviously have accounted for, I know it was brought up before, the uh, future West Windsor TOD um, that is depicted on the screen. Um, you know, any potential plans um, that may occur within the next few years, um, you know, this, this concept that we've developed and, and, you know, we'll be looking at as time goes on, um, will be flexible to potential changes that occur um, between now and when implementation may take place. Um, so while, you know, the specific staff on this study can't speak directly um, to the specific bond drive extension, um, I can answer directly to, you know, if it's something that can be incorporated, if, if it is something that happens to be implement implemented, implemented, implemented between now and when this would be implemented, um, it, this study would have the capacity to be flexible in that regard. So they did say that they were going to use the current... Um crossing and not a, add another crossing as a stopgap measure and ask you to use that parking lot 
for a road in their plan. I don't know if they've actually done that. I have another question though, which is um, about the station um, at, um, which you call the Fieldson Street station, but um, it's where you have it is right behind someone's house um, on the plan. So I assume it's gonna go Wilder because there is a, um, a roadway that goes straight from Wilder into the train, tra the dinky tracks. Um, and I have a question about parking at that station. Will the parking in the Penn Stack neighborhood be restricted to residents only? And will the station actually be on the side where the offices are? And do you have access to parking on that on where the offices are for people who want to park at that station? Um, as far as uh, I, I believe the hypothetical, um, the conceptual of Fieldson Street Station, um, you know, again, as far as specific determinations on, on where specific stations may go, if we even decide that additional stations will become part of the alternatives, um, that's much further down the line. So, you know, everything that we've put up here, again, is just the visual representation of the concepts that we've been, you know, wanting to relay to everyone and talk through what it is that we're looking at. Um, and then, you know, as far as the specific parking question as far as the Penn's Neck neighborhood, uh, New Jersey Transit would not be in a position, I think, to, to make, you know, yeah, this, uh, discretion, just, you know, this have discretion over what I'm trying to say, municipal roadways and who and who could park there. Um, and then, you know, as far as a bit more detail and the more planning uh, related ends of things, I'm going to pass this over to, to, to Lou. Uh, another just quick comment is that, uh, again, these are hypothetical stations. There's been no determination whether there would be parking or not. Uh, it, it would depend on the utility of the station, whether it's a, a, an access point for local uh, folks and, and whether parking would even be needed. That would all be TBD in, in a subsequent analysis. But it really matters when you're talking about what plan you want to approve and if you want to approve a station there because um, it really affects the traffic going through our neighborhood. Um, if there's a station, so if the station is located on Fieldston, it's one thing because there's a row of, um, of parking, short-term parking that you could put on that street that doesn't affect houses. If it's at Wilder um, and Mather, then there isn't a lot of space. So it really does matter. No, I, we, that's understood. And uh, the details, all that would be borne out in later analysis uh, which would include significant input from uh, the community and community stakeholders so that we could understand what the needs and concerns are and, and determine what the needs would be uh, for the project. And there is an office park on the south side of that. Um, is that something that you consider as a place where people could park where you put the actual station in the office park um, and not in the neighborhood? It's still, uh, again, this is all, this would all be to be determined. The stations right now are just in included as hypotheticals. I see. So that would be addressed at the design stage um, if New Jersey Transit moves forward. Correct. Okay, um, let's see. We need to move on to the next question. Uh, our, our partners at New Jersey Transit have agreed to stay for an additional 15 minutes. Uh, so our hard deadline for this meeting is 6.45 at this point. So uh, we'll, we'll move forward with the next question is Catherine Beach. <clears throat> Hi, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, so my name is Catherine Beach and I live at 202 Mather. So I my property backs up to the Dinky Line and to the Dinky Woods, which is that green space you were referring to. Um, so if there's there is a station at the end of Wilder I would be immediately impacted. So I, I, I had a couple of, I had one comment, which was that for the properties on Mather Avenue, there is the utility company or the township or the train, New Jersey Transit did not provide any fencing. The fencing is provided by the homeowners. Um, so if it is improved, you know, we'd like to throw in a request for better fencing. Um, the, the second thing is that I wanted to ask about any planned crosswalks or walkways. I did ask this question earlier anonymously. Um, there is sort of an unofficial 
crosswalk, crosswalk at Wilder Avenue into the Black Rock complex. Um, but I didn't know if there were any plans for more or better marked crosswalks. So people could get from one side, you know, from Alexander onto Mather, or Alexander onto Mather, Alexander onto Route One or vice versa. Is there any discussion about what those would be and where? Uh, let me let me handle that one. Um, I have seen the the gravel there, and I know people cross it. And you know, I know our heavy rail folks frown on pedestrians crossing, trespassing heavy rail tracks. Um, I think uh, if it if it's a no build and we keep it as a dinky, you know, that has to be addressed just as a trespassing uh, location. Uh, in the event. Uh, we do not go forward with a station in that area because you know there's a lot of opposition. We're listening to you. If you don't want the station there, it's 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 something we can consider taking out. However, if you want to, you know, if it's light rail, uh, which is not as, you know, any crossing of any vehicle can has potential to be dangerous, but light rail and buses are, have a safer way of you know maybe getting across. So my point being is, with an option one. Even if we didn't put a station there, if if the neighbor you know, if the neighborhood still wanted some sort of accommodation to get access to that side of the tr tracks, we could consider some sort of a safe crossing. If it remains heavy rail, that's a that's a, se a separate issue. Right. Okay. And I and I can oh sorry, Catherine. Uh, I would just wanted to address your first comment about the Wilder Avenue because I keep pe people hearing people talk about Wilder Avenue Station, Wilder Avenue Station, and it just occurred to me that. If you did see the old, the former presentation, you may have seen in Alternative Two that there was a station at Wilder Avenue. That was only because in Alternative Two because we couldn't fit it down at Fieldston Road. So uh, as a potential station location, it, it wouldn't work because the, it, the the cross section was too large. So for Alternative Two, we did have a slide that was showing in the previous presentation a potential station at Wilder Road. Since Alternative Two is no longer um, being considered, I, I I doubt we would we would continue to look at 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 a station up there because of the impacts to the to the open space there. But as Lou had mentioned, even the Fieldston Road station is is conceptual or theoretical at this point, just looking at our options. But I just wanted to mention because I keep hearing people mention the Wilder Avenue. Okay, and and my other question was about parking um, impacting the neighborhood. Um, and so I, but Sharon addressed that uh, question effectively. So I don't think we need to do it. Um, and I guess I was confused. I thought there would be a station closer to Roselle Road and it, mostly with access on the southbound side. Are we talking about something closer to Fieldston um, to, to the, the fourth, what I think of as the fourth house is on Fieldston. And so we're talking in that area, or are we talking more in the undeveloped land closer to Roselle Road? Or is it so hypothetical it just doesn't matter? Well, I, I think you, this is a little from transit. You, your last statement uh, hit it on the head. It is so hypothetical. We are not anywhere near uh, making a determination yet. And when we are at a point where we are looking at that, we will be soliciting your and others' input to determine whether there would be a station, where it would be, what the access would be, what the issues would be, whether or not there would be parking. That is all TBD. Okay, well, thank you. You're thank welcome. you, th th those are my questions. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Let's move to Barbara Gantwerk. Hi, uh, I'm also one of the four houses on Mather Avenue and was very concerned, I think, as, as Mark talked about, about having um, a whole buses, and bike paths and, and train uh, right in our backyard. And the drawings were not exactly clear as to exactly where it would be, but it seemed as it would be right in our uh, backyard. Um, and I think we are concerned about, as people mentioned, what would happen in the neighborhood in terms of um, of doing that and the stations. I understand now that they're hypothetical and, and we would like to be able to have a voice in making sure hypothetical doesn't become reality. But in any event, my, my one thing is asking how the four houses on Mather as well as on Fieldston seem to have a particular 
um, negative impact in terms of the quality of life um, as, as we uh, are accustomed to, will there be an opportunity to engage with us because no one has to date and, um, and we are concerned about it greatly. Chris, is it safe to say that that's part of a, a future effort as you advance the design work and determine where stations will go? Uh, reorienting our, our communal laptops. Um, no, I mean, it's, it's absolutely safe to say that, you know, this, these specific residents, as well as anyone you know, who are interested in the West Windsor community will have the opportunity to engage, whether it be surveys, uh, outreach, um, you know, any avenue that is going to be included in the future design and research of this study, it, it will, you know, there will be opportunities, ample opportunities for um, those directly within these communities, riders or not, to engage with what it is we're discussing, the things that we're, you know, reviewing. And, and you know, we, I think we've, you know, I think we've made it directly clear as far as the removal of alternative to that, you know, we, we want to be responsive and we're not trying to, you know, bring in any type of alternative that would, you know, greatly impact, you know, quality of life properties in that regard. Right, but I think it's clear to us that our houses will be greatly impacted if there are trains, if there are, you know, different uh, buses. Um, so we do feel it, it, it would be a significant impact and it would be very close to us. So we would, appre I appreciate this meeting and would appreciate the opportunity to, to uh, talk about it and be included in any discussions. Uh, Barbara, hi, this is Barbara Lazaro from New Jersey Transit. I wanted to jump in and speak to a fellow Barbara. Um, we, really, <laughs> we really appreciate your concerns. Um, we're, we're taking note of each and every one and this dialogue is very, very valuable to us. And as we've been saying throughout the presentation, this is all hypothetical, um, strictly uh, conceptual, and we will be continuing to reach out um, to, to you as residents and, and through your municipal officials as we go further along in the process. So, so please don't think your concerns are unheard. They're very important to us and we are taking them into consideration as we speak. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. We appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you for your question. I think we have time for one more live question. Uh, that would be Adrian. Yes, right. Hi. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Uh, thanks for taking my question. Uh, my name is Adrian Pietschuk, and I'm a Princeton resident at 14 Lawrence Drive, and I'm a student at the university. Um, so I really appreciate the commitment to the zero emissions route, um, but I was wondering to hear a bit more about uh, what the agency thinks about um, the reliability of battery electric vehicles at this time. Um, it seems like the preferred pr proposal would remove some of the overhead catenary that currently is there. Um, as I'm sure you're aware, like uh, in Boston, the MBTA has replaced its trolley buses recently, which used overhead wires with electric buses. Um, but they've also had to install diesel powered heaters uh, so that the buses can remain warm and operational during the winter. Um, so I know that this is, you know, still very preliminary, but um, has NJ Transit anticipated similar challenges? Could you speak a bit more about the types of vehicles you're considering if you anticipate any winter heating issues? And also a, a secondary question that's similar is, um, given that these are battery operated vehicles, how long of a, how, lo how large of, of a fleet do you anticipate needing um, to maintain um, frequent headways while the other vehicles are charging? So this, this is Lou from, from Transit. Um, it, it's too soon in the process. We haven't identified a specific vehicle, but we, we know a few things, uh, right? Uh, for example, the, the line is already electrified. And so, so we have access to electricity. Uh, that's very helpful. The, the transmission lines, the overhead catenary system, they, they exist. We do know that there are technologies that permit uh, both steel wheeled and rubber tired vehicles to access overhead electricity if that's what's uh, chosen. 
Uh, yes, the electric vehicle market is new. There are uh, issues. We have, uh, we're looking at it in other parts of our system, trying to make a determination about how diesel buses can be replaced with, with electric buses and what the impacts are, what the reliability, availability, a lot of questions. Uh, but we are starting off, I think, with a, a, a little bit of a leg up in already having an electrified system there now. Uh, so I'm hopeful that with, a, with a, a combined light rail and electric bus solution, whether it's an electric bus, an electric tram, that, that we stand a much better chance of implementing a, an electric service uh, because it isn't from scratch in this case. Now, in terms of the fleet size, uh, I, I, I can't answer that at this time. It depends on the frequency, but you're talking about a short run. Uh, and so we're not talking about a huge fleet here. Uh, we're talking about a limited number of vehicles. Um, and, uh, you know, we will see. Uh, a lot of this will be borne out later in the analysis uh, once we determine, uh, you know, specifically the kind of vehicles that we would be using, how they need to be serviced, their energy requirements. Uh, but again, you've got electricity there now, and uh, that that is a good leg up to have because not uh, there are other lines that do not. Okay, thank you for that answer. Uh, we're at the limit of our time, really. I have a couple of housekeeping things, and then I believe the mayor would like to uh, address the, the the panel and the the residents. So the housekeeping things are that the video of this meeting will be posted on the township's website. If you have any follow-up questions or any questions that didn't get answered at this meeting, um, please email email or regular mail those to the clerk's office or you can drop them off in the bins out front um, and we will get answers to those questions. So uh, Mayor, are you uh, able to address us? Yes, I, I can. Uh, I, I would like to an answer one uh, uh, question that was raised uh, before thanking everyone. Uh, third or fourth caller asked about the connection through the NJ Transit parking lot for the Avalon project. And that's not part of the Dinky project, but Avalon is working very closely with NJ Transit to make that happen. And before Avalon uh, uh, opens up, that, uh, that uh, connection will happen through the parking lot. It's not the second crossing of the Dinky. It's, it's the existing connection to the existing parking lot from Road A for those who are familiar with the uh, with the Avalon project, it will be connected through the road. Uh, so that is definitely happening. And if you have any questions, you can reach uh, reach to me directly. Uh, I would like to take uh, this opportunity to thank uh, NJ Transit, all the folks who attended and staying extra for 15 minutes, to Mike Stevens, our councilman, for arranging this, and John for uh, doing the moderation. You are an expert now. And I just want to Thank assure you. all residents that uh, the township will be engaged with NJ Transit as the project moves forward. And we will make sure that your concerns and uh, are addressed and comments are heard and uh, uh, taken into consideration before uh, any final decision is made. So uh, please do reach out to any council members or uh, Mr. Stevens is in your neighborhood to him or any council members or to me, but we will definitely uh, be engaged with the transit folks before a final decision is made and everybody will be heard. So thank you everyone who attended this meeting and uh, who made this possible. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Just real quick before I know everyone probably wants to get going, but um, I want to thank you know the mayor, the esteemed council, all the municipal staff and the residents of West Windsor alike for taking the time to listen to our presentation, ask questions, um, you know, I, I echo everything that the mayor has said. Um, you know, we're here as a resource to them to answer questions um, as this study goes forward, both in this phase and beyond. Um, so, you know, many thanks to everyone again for, you know, taking some time out of your Tuesday to, to come in and speak with us. So thank you. Have a great evening, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.